Well, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for the invitation. I hope that here in the flesh I'm not a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I thought that uh, I would begin by telling you I have a little bit of back history with Valerie Riches, and um, who I didn't know at the time she was connected with the Family Education Trust. But I was uh, working as a, a BBC reporter, and I was down at College Green. This would be back in the 1990s sometime. I was working for BBC news programs. Um, and um, there had been a lobby of Parliament, and there was some bill going through. I think it was in connection with uh, David Alton and an abortion bill, but I can't remember the exact details. Anyway, after it was all over and we were milling around, I. Um, I bumped into Valerie and started to talk to her. And um, I was fully in sympathy with her view of the issue of the day. And she said to me um, how unusual it was to meet a BBC reporter, or indeed any reporter, who showed any sympathy for her viewpoint. Um, anyway, I continued my connection with Valerie, and indeed with her husband, because it, as it happens, they lived near Mary in Oxford, and um, I became a, a trustee of the Family Publications, which was um, a, a little publishing house which put out books um, with a Christian message mainly. And um, I was a trustee of that until Dennis sadly died a few years ago and the thing folded. But um, I had a great deal of admiration for Valerie because she was, um, it takes some courage, you know, to stand up against the, the tide and say unpopular things. Um, but one of the conversations that I had with her, a repeated conversation, was the difficulty of engaging with the media and getting the media to tell your side of the story. And... Um, this is something which is not just a problem for you. It's a problem for many um, groups, campaigning groups, who have a socially conservative agenda. Because, by and large, um, the media is not sympathetic. Um, I'll just explain a little about my background, just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I, I was in the BBC for 25 years. Um, I left uh, about 14, 15 years ago, so I'm a little out of touch now. But um, I joined up the BB with the BBC, and I was very proud to do so because I had imbibed with my mother's milk that um, the BBC was the finest broadcaster in the world. And you know that was a view very common um, amongst the population at the time, I think. And uh, I thought, you know, I've got it made. Finally, I'm entering the hallowed portals. And um, that rather starry-eyed view of the BBC took a while to, the scales took a while to drop from my eyes. But it became apparent to me through the course of my career with the BBC that the BBC is not what it says it is. I mean, the, the crucial thing about the BBC, its USP, if you like, is that it is an impartial organization. Um, the, the great uh, fabrication is this, that because we all pay for the BBC, everyone has to have a television license, and therefore um, everyone has a voice. Um, this turns out paradoxically to be exactly the reverse of the truth, because the way the BBC is set up um, has guaranteed its independence, and that indeed was the whole purpose of having the license fee in the first place. So the idea was that the BBC would not be a state broadcaster. It would not be under the control of politicians. And I think we can all see why that is a, a good and healthy idea in a democracy. It's a noble ideal. Um, but the, the license fee guarantees the BBC's independence. The trouble is, what has it done with that independence? The BBC has actually been hijacked, in a way, by... Um, a strand of thought, progressive thought, um, which now makes it, in my view, a battering ram for one side of the argument. And that side of the argument is what is termed 
progressive. Although when I look at the, the society we now inhabit, a society which has been molded and formed um, like clay on the potter's wheel, it's been molded and it now espouses so-called progressive values. But what are these progressive values and how is it progress? You know, we now live in a society where abortion is a commonplace, where the crime rate is higher and seems to inexorably get higher year on year, where family life is destabilized, where family breakdown is a common thing, where divorce is all too common and all too frequent, where rates of mental health problems are rising, particularly among young people. And you ask yourself, is this progress? Well, actually, it isn't. But in my view, we need to reverse some of this so-called progress. The problem is, how do we go about doing that? Um, the one area where you know, we can say there has been definite progress is in a material sense. And I don't decry that because there's nothing great about poverty. But the underlying values of society, um, the things which really matter to people, have been undermined to a great degree by progressive ideas which have chipped away at the foundation of a healthy society, particularly healthy family life. Um, so, you know, what part does the BBC play in this? Um, the BBC's cultural reach is greater and longer than that of any other organization in the country. Um, the BBC still says on its website that that uh, more than 90% of the population use its service at least once a week. Um, it doesn't specify what services, but you know, maybe it's internet services, maybe it's Radio 4, maybe it's the television news, whatever it is. When you think about it, that is, uh, that is an astonishing statistic and one which tells you the sort of impact that the BBC is having on society. Um, the uh, no other organization, you know, be it your local council or central government, whatever, no other organization touches so many people um, and in such an intimate way, you know, when you're having your shave or brushing your teeth or having your breakfast, there is the BBC on in the background, um, telling you things and molding your ideas. Um, So what is the nature of the BBC and who are the people who, who man it? Um, I think to explain what has happened in the BBC, you need to, of course, this isn't just the BBC, of course. I mean, this is, this is something which has happened across society, not just to the, the BBC, but there has been a long march through the institutions by people who have a definite political agenda. And these people call themselves progressives. Um, they are, by and large, on the left, although it's surprising how many politicians of the right describe themselves also as being progressive, um, which is why, of course, we can't rely on a so-called conservative government to be, in any sense, socially conservative, one of the great tragedies of the politics of our day. Um, I think the, the answer to why there was such a radical change in the BBC during the 60s and 70s and 80s, is the explanation is something to do with a generational change. I think that the, the, the war generation, the generation my parents belonged to, those people who had lived through the long years of war from 1914 to 1945, that, that period of time when war dominated everybody's thoughts, that generation, of course, had little choice but to exercise discipline and self-restraint because it was imposed on them by the circumstances of history. When we got to the 60s, 
uh, one of the paradoxes of the Cold War period is that that was an extremely stable time in, in world history because we had these two big antagonistic camps staring at each other across barbed wire right across the world. It sort of stabilized world conflicts. In fact, you know, it was a period when, bar a few ex uh, um, exceptions like the, the Vietnam War, for instance, but um, you know, it, was, it was actually a peaceful time in many parts of the world, unusually so. And um, the generation which came after that wartime generation, of course, felt no need for that restraint. And the need for discipline, the thing which they probably saw in their parents, was the thing they reacted against. And in the 1960s, the, um, the great revolution began, and we began to grant ourselves all sorts of liberties and freedoms which our parents had denied themselves. And often these were in the realm of uh, personal life and personal relationships, so particularly in sexual relationships. Now, um, it isn't difficult, of course, to persuade people to adopt lifestyles which simply follow their own instincts. It isn't difficult to tell people that you will be a happier and more fulfilled person if you follow your sexual instincts and sleep with who you wish. Um, the, the damage that that does to stable family relationships is something which is the other side of the equation and not much talked about. The BBC, as I say, in, uh, as, as many other organizations and walks of life, therefore had an intake of, of young people who were filled with these ideas and intoxicated by the new liberties which this generation promised itself. And um, throughout the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, right up to the, 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 the present day, the BBC has instinctively allied itself with any uh, campaign which is transgressive. It, um, so if you take it, the abortion issue, um, one which Valerie Riches, for instance, was, was, was particularly interested. Um, and as I say, that's when I first met her on a, a lobby of parliament to do with that very issue. Um, I don't think I have ever heard, certainly not in the past 20, 30 years, I've never heard a fair-minded discussion on the BBC about abortion. Um, what I have often heard is um, reports about countries which in their uh, reactionary stupidity have failed fully to implement the idea of abortion on demand. Um, just a few months ago, there was the, the question of extending abortion rights to Northern Ireland. And that was a, an issue where there was a clear question of democratic accountability. After all, the whole point of devolution is that um, the different parts of the United Kingdom should be able to make their own rules and regulations in certain areas of life. But that was not the line taken by the BBC. The line taken by the BBC was, why are these people in Northern Ireland being so tardy and reactionary about this thing which is an obvious good? And the, the, the tone of the coverage was laudatory, so it was, you know, good old Parliament stepping in and correcting this obvious wrong. And the BBC does this, it lines up on these arguments almost without thinking. It's a, an absolutely instinctive response. Now, I should say something about my ex-colleagues. Many of them are very nice people. They tend to be very well-educated people. They tend to be middle-class people. Um, they're very congenial people to work with, and uh, the BBC is a very interesting place to work. But they have a curious blind spot, and it is that they do not see their views as political. 
The BBC tends to see its own position, which is born of its internal culture, as being something which is, as it were, value-free. It is uh, a combination of, in their mind, decency and civilized values. So um, <laughs> the not something which 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 uh, which will much exercise the uh, this particular organization but the brexit debate i think displayed this very clearly that in brexit the bbc took a view instinctively that leaving the bbc was uh, leaving the eu was the <laughs> leaving <laughs> leaving the eu was the wrong thing to do uh, you know it was a wrong and wicked thing to do and why on earth would anyone want to do that it has to be some sort of mental aberration if you want to do that. You've got to be not only, um, you're not only wrong, you're actually wicked if you want to lead the, 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 the EU. And that showed up very clearly the way the BBC, uh, it lacks the facility for self-examination because it believes itself to be right. And anyone who criticizes the BBC or takes issue with the BBC is therefore putting themselves in the BBC's eyes in the wrong. And not only are you wrong, you're probably evil. Um, I mean, I've spent a long, long time um, campaigning about the BBC. I wrote my first book, well, actually going back beyond that, when I was still in the BBC, I wrote to all the governors of the BBC pointing out what I felt to be um, uh, lapses in the creed of impartiality. And the governors, I think, were somewhat baffled by my, by my approach to them. I wrote to them all individually and said, look, you know, I'm just someone in the trenches. I'm just a reporter, right? I'm working for the Today program, and uh, I don't think we're getting this right. And I gave them chapter and verse. It was a little dossier I presented to them. But there was no reaction to that. They actually wrote back and said, you know, to, they actually complimented me and said, you know, it's very nicely written. <laughs> 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 well, I was delighted, you know, very nicely written. Uh, great to have that compliment. But, but, you know, the point was they would not engage. And if they will not engage. This is the problem. They will not engage with their critics. I think it's because if they did engage with their critics, they would lose the argument. Um, but... Um, they're in a position, because of their independence, because of their guaranteed income, they're insulated, actually, from the pressures which apply to everyone else. I mean, it is a great irony, isn't it, that uh, the BBC holds every other organization in the country, every institution is held to account by the BBC, you know, be it from the monarchy to the parish council. Everyone can be hauled up by the BBC and cross-questioned and put in the dock by the BBC. But the BBC itself, who can do that to it? There is no, there is no body which can hold it to account. Ofcom is said to be its regulator. Ofcom is mainly staffed by ex-BBC people. In fact, it was an ex-BBC man who set up Ofcom. You know, the point is, they're all in it together. Um, now... My view of the BBC is that it has been involved in a long grooming process of the British public. It does this unconsciously. Um, it doesn't see its own bias. Uh, there was a very famous American sociologist by the name of uh, Peter Berger, and he was, he was one of the bright young things of the 1960s. And he wrote a... Um, he wrote a very influential article, actually, about the death of religion, the end of religion. He, he foresaw, in fact, he predicted that come the turn of the century and the new millennium, that religion would have withered away, would just be, there would be dwindling and isolated bands of people around the world who still held on to these superstitions. Um, but he came to revise that opinion over the years. He came to see that actually... Religion was something which is deeply embedded in society and in individuals, and it is not something which is just a passing fad. It's not going to go away. But he said, and this was his crucial insight, he said that the, 
the ideas of secularism, the ideas uh, or that, and just in passing, secularism passes itself off as neutrality, but of course it's not. Secularism is not neutral. Secularism is actually hostile to religious belief. And the BBC is infused from stem to stern with a belief in secularism and um, a, a celebration of atheism. It was no surprise the way that the BBC celebrated Dawkins' book, um, The God Delusion. You know, they took that on and they publicized it mightily through the World Service too, right across the world, because it was a book which really chimed with the central ethos of the BBC. Um, the grooming process which the BBC undertakes with us, its passive audience, is a very subtle thing. So here's a trivial example, trivial but I think in context quite an important one. On Thursday night, or it might be Wednesday night, the 1800 bulletin on Radio 4, which, by the way, has always been regarded in the BBC as a special kind of bulletin. So um, old, the old BBC idea was that if you listened to the 6 o'clock news on Radio 4, you would be getting a full breakdown of all the news you needed to know. Well, on Thursday evening, one of the items on that bulletin was the fact that the WI had chosen to put on the cover of its magazine for the first time a trans woman, right? Now, um, you might well ask yourself, why in all that had happened in the world that day, why was that picked out by the editor of the Six O'Clock News as an item that should be covered in that important bulletin? Um, as I say, it's a trivial example, but it shows you the way in which uh, insidiously ideas are slipped in to everyday coverage. So a casual listener to that bulletin would just have picked up on the fact that, you know, a trans, there had been um, another little landmark had been passed by a trans woman, and it involved the WI. And it just accustoms us to the idea that trans women are women, all the rest of it, all the stuff you've just heard from Sharon. Um, I like the idea of social contagion, contagion, by the way, because I think... You know, the, the BBC is, in many respects, the exact carrier of that social contagion. It disseminates these things, and it does so, um, it does so in all its different levels of programming. It's not just the news. It's in drama programs. It's in comedy programs. It's in light entertainment. It's everywhere. Um, the... the, the the philosophy, the internal culture of the BBC is all embracing. And I know, you know from personal experience how difficult it is to stand up to that and say, well, uh, you know, there's another side to this story. Because if you do that, of course, um, you, you do mark yourself out as something of an oddball, at least in BBC terms. Um, the latest uh, battlefronts in the progressive agenda are transgenderism, which you've heard about from the previous speaker, um, and euthanasia is another one. So the BBC is always eager to give airtime to hard luck stories about people who are dying painful deaths and pleading for the right to end their own lives with the assistance of the doctor. Um, it doesn't matter how often the um, palliative care consultants group says, we don't want this, or the BMA says, we don't think this is a very good idea. Um, the BBC is determined that this is a campaign which should be backed and furthered. And they show no sign of um, giving up on that. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I do think that uh, 
being pessimistic for a moment, I, I, I think it's probably not far off the day when we will see legislation on that issue, unfortunately. So the question is, why, why is this happening? Why is an organization which, after all, as a journalistic organization, is wedded to the idea of free inquiry, intellectual curiosity, and telling the truth, why is it that it does none of these things? Why is it so blinkered? Why is it so one-sided in the way that it presents and discusses these issues? Um, that is, uh, that's a difficult question to answer, but my explanation for it is this, that the BBC, in its higher echelons, is composed of people who are um, very similar in certain regards. So a lot of them, a disproportionate number of them, have been through the Oxbridge Mill. Um, they've been exposed to ideas about the Enlightenment and what the Enlightenment meant. They have been they have been taught and have come to believe that the underpinnings of British society and British public morality owe nothing to their Christian uh, antecedents, but everything to the Enlightenment, which was when the superstition ended and the light came in, and that's why we've got progress. And these are unquestioned assumptions within the BBC. And you can see it once you start looking with a critical eye at what the BBC tells you about the world. You can see it in almost everything that they produce. Um, it's, you know, to use a, the idea of deconstructionism, well, let's deconstruct what news is. You know, news is not something that falls out of the tree at your feet every morning. The news is what is constructed in the newsroom by the news editor and his reporters and his producers. The news is a construct. And the BBC's construct of news is one-sided and propagandist, and that is the that is the plain, simple truth of the matter. There is a kind of neo-Marxism in the BBC, a cultural Marxism, by which I mean that the, the, the salient features of Marxism, its atheism, its collectivism, its, uh, its disregard for religious tradition and family tradition. All these things are deeply embedded in it. And um, the BBC essentially um, regurgitates those kind of opinions on a daily basis. Um, it's a question really of you know, how the BBC therefore controls the debate. Um, some of you might be familiar with the idea of something called the Overton Window. So Overton was a, an American um, researcher, sociologist, I think. And he, um, he had this idea of trying to understand how public debate is controlled. And he came up with this idea that the public debate exists within this window. The crucial thing is, where is the window frame? You know, um, now, this is a very cunning construct. Overton said, within the window, you have a range from what is unacceptable, scary, and radical to what is current government policy. And in between, you have various shades of opinion. And uh, the, the trick which is played on us all is this that there is a simulacrum of a, f a free and vigorous debate, but you have to look at where the window frame is. 
what is outside the frame? Why is it that your voice, or the voice of other socially conservative campaigning views, campa campaigning groups, why is their voice, your voice, not heard on the BBC? It is because within this construct of the window, your views lie outside the window. Your views are too radical. And, and this leads to all sorts of absurdities. You know, if you take this, you know, there has been a flurry of interest in the past few years about increasing uh, incidence of, of mental health problems among young people. Okay. Um, that's a very fair topic to be discussing and debating, and, it won, and it's one which certainly deserves to be debated. Now, if I was setting out to, um, to debate that and investigate it, I think a very fair avenue of debate would be what has the transgender campaign done to the mental health of children, right? Or another angle would be what has the rate of family breakdown done to the mental health of children? You know, many psychiatrists would agree that family stability or family instability is probably the most important factor in a child's mental well-being. That once that goes, you know, all sorts of problems arise, which we can all understand. It's, it's obvious. But that is not an angle you will ever hear pursued. You will hear um, people expressing concern about the rise in mental health ch uh, issues in children, but there's no follow-through on any angle which would challenge the underlying assumptions of the so-called progressive agenda to which I referred initially. The progressive agenda says that um, free and easy divorce or cohabitation without marriage or um, sequential marriages or sequential relationships, um, these are all well and good, and they are equally valid and, um, and good for all involved. This is obviously a lie. This is obviously an untruth. It's not true. You know, what is obviously true is that for children to be brought up by their two biological parents in a stable family situation is the best possible circumstance for a child to be raised. No argument. It's not an argument you'll ever hear on the BBC. It's not an argument they'll put their weight behind. So, um, what can be done about this? So, the, uh, <laughs> the title of this talk I see in the agenda you have, rather optimistically, is uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you how to get a fair hearing. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so, um, as I joked once before with an audience I was talking to about the same thing, I said, well, you know, it's easy. All you have to do to get a fair hearing is just change your minds about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you just signed up to the progressive agenda, no problem. You know, you can get on the way air airwaves too. You can put your point of view. But how do you get a fair hearing for your views? How do you get these socially conservative issues raised on the BBC or in other media. Um, and that is a real problem. However, there are things you can do. Um, just in the past few weeks, we've had the advent of this new TV station, GB News. Some of you may have seen a little of it. I've, I've dipped in and out of it. And despite its well publicized technical problems, um, because there have been an inordinate number of gaffes. But um, that aside, that is a very healthy development, because it means that you've got an alternative. And um, I, I was very interested, in fact, I, I met and interviewed uh, for another thing I was doing, uh, one of the presenters on um, GB News, a woman called Alex Phillips. And uh, what had interested me about her was that in her program, this was in the first 10 days, I think, 
she initiated a discussion about pornography. And um, her, her take on it was a refreshingly upfront, you know, why do we have to have this pornography? And why is it available to children so easily? You know, why aren't you doing something about this? She was very upfront about it. She clearly thinks pornography is a very bad thing. She thinks it's an awful thing for children. And she is basically on our side, I would say. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't like to... You know, she, she's never going to become a, a paid-up member of the Family Education Trust, perhaps. But I think that her instincts on this sort of issue are very much in line with what I take it to be most of your instinct, too. So there is a new avenue. And the point about this is, is that... Um, if we look at what happened in America with Fox News, that changed the whole media landscape. Not only did Fox News find an audience, so it found an audience which didn't want to be told the same old, same old by CNN and CBS and all the rest of them. It wanted to hear something new. It wanted that audience, their audience, wanted to hear something which chimed with their views, which, where their voices were heard. And that's what's been lacking in the, the British media scene. I mean, I have confined most of my remarks to, to the BBC, but of course it's not just the BBC. It's not as if um, Channel 4 or Sky News or ITN offer anything by way of difference. They're all much of a muchness when it comes to these issues. None of these outlets are outlets excuse me, outlets which are sympathetic to a social conservative viewpoint. But I think that GB News um, will be. And so what I would advise uh, the FET and every other campaigning group which is currently shut out by virtue of the being outside the window, that um, you should concentrate on that new source, that new outlet, you know, get your views on there because, you know, this is all about networking, isn't it? You all have, you all have contacts, I have contacts. If you get something on GB News, you can um, tell your contacts and slowly the word will spread. And once people find something which is attuned to their own perspective, to their own viewpoint, then it'll build an audience. And that will have an effect on the other broadcasters. The point is the BBC is not a passive, it cannot simply sit back and uh, just allow this to happen without reacting itself. If GB News is a success, there's no guarantee that it will be, but it might be. And if it is, then the BBC, that will have a react, you know, that will have, um, that will force a reaction from the BBC itself. You know, at the moment, BBC caters Splendidly, it's a Rolls-Royce service for one side of the political debate. And it is no use at all to the rest of us. Um, and it's very easy to get downhearted and pessimistic about these things. And uh, I'm sure that we've all had bleak moments when we've considered uh, you know, what we're up against. But what should give us all heart is what happened in 2016 in the Brexit debate, because that was, a, that was a, an enormous upset for the established media, particularly the media. I mean, also the political establishment, also the, the civil service establishment, the educational establishment, they were all horrified. But the BBC particularly was horrified because it is so used to getting its own way. It was absolutely mortified by the result. And what that shows is that despite its loud voice, its great megaphone bellowing these progressive ideas at us, in fact, not everyone is persuaded. And I am sure, for instance, on the transgender issue, that out there in voter land, um, they're on our side, not theirs. That, you know, that, that 
there's a there's a there's a there's a residual common sense in people. But of course, what they don't get at the moment, that common sense is not nourished by any input from the media. They don't get encouragement. You know, they don't. So if you're a mum, you know, worried about the sex education that your child is getting in primary school, you're not going to hear much affirmation of your views on the BBC. You know, what you will hear is um, exactly the reverse. You know, why are these people protesting at school gates? You know, I mean, isn't it awful that they're trying to interfere with sex education in primary schools? As if that in itself was, you know, that's the wrong rather than the teaching itself. So it's very easy for people to feel isolated. And of course, this is where GB News and other news, and talk radio is another one, actually, which is an alternative. And um, I'm not saying either, you know, they're not absolutely what I listen to 24 hours a day, but that's not the point. The point is that as a campaigning group, you've got to make merry where you can. You've got to make hay when the sun shines. And GB News might be somewhere where the sun is shining for you, at least now. So get in there and start talking. And take heart from the fact that um, you know, Brexit was eventually won in the face of, in spite of, that massive monolithic opposition from the BBC and all the rest of the establishment, which said, you cannot have this, you must be mad, and we've got it. And so what that tells us is that the tide can be turned. That, and, and it's just a question of keeping on in there fighting. I may well not live, live to see it myself. Maybe you won't. But the tide will turn because the arguments you are making are not only are they commonsensical, they're right. They are right. They're morally right. And they're right for children and for, and for families. So stick at it. <laughs>